peace, that you will be gracious to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us, that we might encounter you, and that, Lord, that we would leave here on Sunday afternoon transformed, changed from the way we began this night. We ask that each of the four sessions bring transformation in our hearts, a greater passion, a greater desire for you, a greater hunger for you, a greater uh, inward life that brings transformation, intimacy, and glory. We ask for that, Father. Father, as we go on in Psalm 67, we ask that your way may be known on the earth and your salvation among all the nations. We ask for revelation of what is upon us and we ask for your anointing to know how to prepare for it. We ask, Father, for a revelation of preparation to come this weekend, we ask. Moving on, we say, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let, the, let all the peoples praise you. And we say, above all, let Christ be exalted in our midst. We're here to honor the man Christ Jesus. And we ask that that be the case. We're moving on. It says, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness. And so, Father, we, we ask that you will prepare your church for the judgments that are coming upon the earth and the judgments that will prepare your people to stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ. We ask for that preparation anointing to give us the ability to be a people made ready. And Lord, it says also, and guide the nations on the earth. Lord, we know that in many places around the world, the church needs your guidance. We need your guidance. And we ask that the release of guidance to guide the church in the nations, throughout the nations, to be made ready as a bride for Christ, to be made ready to stand in the end times and to be made ready for eternity. We ask for that, Lord. Let the people of God praise you, O Lord. Let all the peoples praise you, the earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Father, we ask that you would release a holy fear of the Lord upon all of us in your church, one that would drive us to a deeper surrender of our lives, a deeper intimacy with you, a deeper desire to be a people made ready for you. We ask for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And Randall's going to come up and blow the shofar. As we were praying uh, in one of our Wednesday night prayer times, we just felt like we needed to blow the shofar to begin this uh, weekend conference, and Randall's our shofar blower. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Amen. 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 All right. Come on up, Terry. We're, we're going to take up an offering, but we're going to wait till the end to do that. And so we just want to welcome Terry. Thank God you. bless you, brother. Thank you, brother. Yeah. The red light on is okay, so it's ready. Yeah, it's ready. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Um, maybe you should take off the offering before I speak. Might give it a little. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't have an expectation for a good offering, so, I mean, anything above one dollar will be above expectation. Not because of you people, just because of the poor message. <laughs> well, anyway, it's good to see you guys. Good to be with you. Good to see you guys um, again, every time. So I ain't got to hug all of you yet, but before it's over, my objective is to give you a hug. That way, if you don't like the message, maybe you'll like me 
<laughs> Probably not, but anyway. <laughs> we'll go with. Got good friends here, and uh, as well as from the Van Leer area. Be leery of Van Leerians. <laughs> I try to tell people Van Leer is a penal colony. <laughs> you get sentenced there. You don't move there. For, it's not one of the top ten places in the world for vacations. It's a penal colony is what we call it. So uh, that's sort of funny, but if you've ever been to Van Leer, you know there's more truth. Hey, Alex, good to see you, brother. So anyway, we got a... Uh, We've got people here from uh, um, our area, and thank you for driving down, guys. Thank you. We tried to drive down today and ended up on the side of I-75, which was really interesting. <laughs> I think that's the first time, y'all have a first here at this church, first time we've ever been stranded on the side of the interstate was coming here. Isn't that a great record? <laughs> so I'm going to open up... Um, to the book of uh, First Peter, and um, try to look at uh, a few things in First Peter and Second Peter. So we'll get as far as we can get. I uh, also want to look at everything from Genesis to Revelation. Just want to make sure you guys are awake. <laughs> but actually, uh, First Peter is where we'll start, chapter three. Of First Peter, I actually have a few notes. I'm not always able to get notes. See, I can't write, so I have to dictate them. And that was a joke. <laughs> uh, sometimes I have notes. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have them and I don't stick to them. Ken, you and Brian ever face that, or the Lord tells you something totally different than what you just prepared and. Josiah and I have had that to happen uh, more times than we'd like to remember, I'm afraid. But uh, we're actually going to come out of 1 Peter chapter 3 and read uh, quite a bit of it and then quite a bit of uh, uh, 2 Peter as well. So let's get started here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 13. Now, who is the one that will harm you if you may become imitators of good? I'm, I'm reading out of the Lavender's New Testament, Russ and Malcolm Lavender translated it. So it's going to read a little bit different, uh, but that's the, the uh, version I'm reading out of. But even if you might suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. And you must not be afraid of their terror. May you not be troubled, but you must reverence the Lord God in your hearts and always be prepared for a defense in everyone, a defense to everyone, excuse me, ask, uh, everyone asking you a reason concerning the hope in you with courtesy and respect. Have a good, having a good conscience, and I, I like to say that good conscience is a, a God consciousness that's in view here. Other passages in uh, Hebrews points this out. Um, we either have an evil conscience or we have a God conscience or a good conscience. That's not a minor thing as we'll see as we go into these passages that wherein they speak against you as evildoers, the ones being abusive may be put to shame by your good conduct in Christ. Now it is better to suffer doing good if the will of God may, may so will it than being an evildoer. So uh, having a good conscience means we're not an evil doer, right? An evil person, a godly conscience. Just want to point the connection between having a good conscience and not being an evil doer. Point that out. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go forward. For Christ also suffered once for all, 
concerning sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh. And it's hard for me not to comment, but remember that verse, having been put to death in the flesh. Why would he say it that way? Because of Genesis. The end of all flesh has come up before me. That's why. And God putting to death all flesh. That's why. Which contextually you can see as we go on into Peter. So it's not just something to say here in a way of saying it. He's going to reference Noah here. Christ also suffered once for all concerning sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but having been made alive by the Spirit, by whom also, having gone, he preached to the spirits in prison, the ones having formerly disobeyed. That's talking about those who were killed in the flood, not demons. It's important that we understand what he's looking at here. We understand about Abraham's bosom, don't we? We understand there was a gulf, and on the other side of that gulf were those in torment, right? The ones having formally disobeyed while the patience of God used to keep, see, so he ties it into the times of Noah, while the patience of God used to keep waiting in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which few, that is eight souls, were safely delivered through water, which antitype now also saves you, that is baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. That's a beautiful way of of saying that. Uh, those in the earth in the times of the flood were killed because of the filth of their flesh. The end of all flesh has come up before me. Right? In Genesis? They were put to death because of the sins of the flesh. And the filth of the flesh but an appeal to God with reference to a good conscience by the resurrection. There's that word conscious coming in, having a good conscience with reference to a good conscience, a God conscious by the res or God consciousness by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers having been subject to him. Then we're going to look at Second uh, Peter as well. Chapter 3, kind of hung up on those threes, aren't we? <laughs> Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, beloved, this is now the second letter I am writing to you in which I stir up your sincere mind by reminder to remember, I like how they say this, to remember the ramas. In other words, remember what God has spoken. It's not saying remember the scriptures. That's true as well, but he's saying remember what God has said, if God has said it. Again, if we're looking at the times of Noah, that was important. It is equally important in our time. Has God spoken? He has. He's spoken most loudly in and through his son. Is that not true? He also spoke through the prophets. He spoke through the apostles concerning the son as the prophets spoke of the son. And then God has spoken multiple times about alignment to his will concerning the son. Has he not? It's important that we remember the ramas. Don't you know? That's what's being said here. Remember the ramas. Have it been spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of your apostles of the Lord and Savior 
knowing this first, that at the last of the days, scoffers will come, going after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his arrival? Part of what's going on in the church right now is there is this uh, resistance to anyone who's saying, and I'm saying by rhema, the Lord is returning. I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm not talking about deducing that from the scriptures. I'm talking about the Lord speaking. And now we've grown into this place to where the coming of the Lord is almost can't be talked about because so much has been said that wasn't true. Number one, it wasn't a rhema. I remember when I was a young man, 88 reasons why Jesus was returning in 1988. They missed it, so then they did 89 reasons why they were returning in 1989. I remember, I'm being serious, that happened. I mean, anybody remember that besides me? I won't say who wrote it because I can't remember. Otherwise, I would. <laughs> oh, no. I'm kidding. <laughs> But see, they were deducing things. That's not a rhema. A rhema is when God speaks. Is that not true? And we've grown very, uh, don't you think, guys? We've grown very unaccustomed to God's voice speaking. And I'm not talking about little insignificant things, like, you know, he's going to give you a new car. That may not be insignificant to you. Probably wouldn't be to me either, but... It's not world shattering either. <laughs> I know about things that really matter, that the Lord's coming. And about that coming, make ready a people. Be a people made ready. And so we almost have at best in the church now an attitude of, well, we'll see. That's the way delay happens. Hastening is by looking for. Is that not right? And thus hastening the day of the Lord. Anyway, I'm not saying, I'm not throwing this open and say, believe everything you hear. I'm not saying that. In fact, I would say differently. We need spiritual discernment. Better known, we need life in the spirit where the inward voice of God, I say again to us, the inward voice of God confirms to every believer what rhema is being spoken. Can you hear what I just said? Where the inward voice of God by the spirit confirms the rhema of God as being true or false. Then that demands a right relationship. And if we're in a sin conscious relationship, evil conscious relationship, we're not going to hear anything. So anyway, let's go on. Uh, we're in a bad place now, generally speaking, in the church. The apostles and prophets of the New Testament preached a gospel that was coupled with the return of the Lord in their time. But they knew what we didn't know, that if you make yourselves ready, he will return in your time. And that's how they preached it. They were not wrong. Because they knew what perhaps we don't. If you don't make yourselves ready and be made ready, he won't. And that's how they preached it. And now it's become almost anathema to preach about the coming of the Lord. And God uh, has something to say in that matter. Amen. He has some rhemas going on. And the church is quite deaf, quite undiscerning. And life in the spirit has not been established well. I'm saying where the inward voice of God confirms his rhemas. And there's more soulish voices going on. That inward life in the spirit, the voice of God. And thus there's great confusion. Scoffing, mocking going on. as was prophesied would happen. A rhema being given to Peter. This is what's going to go on in the last days. They're going to scoff at the coming of the Lord. It's happening. It has happened before, but it's happening again in this generation. Where's the promise of his arrival? 
For from the time which the fathers fell asleep, all things so continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now this escapes them willingly. Notice that word. Now this escapes them willingly. They do not care to remember the rhema when God spoke and the heavens came into existence. Now there's a rhema for you, Randall. You know it? Don't you think? Hello? Anybody awake out there? <laughs> There's a rhema. There's a lot of them in the Bible where God speaks. So it's a willing case of not remembering to remember what is said here, the rhemas. So he's talking about a little bit here of the rhemas. This escapes them willingly that the heavens were existing long ago in the earth out of the water and through the water having been held together by the word of God talking about the rhema. There was no Bible then. It's talking about the rhema. By which the world at that time having been flooded with water perished. There's a rhema again. God warning Noah, there was no Bible. I keep emphasizing that, right? There was no Bible. But God spoke. He still does. And we have a Bible. Amen. Thank God. We should study it and read it and know it so that we may know Jesus Christ, though, not information. If my study of the Bible is not bringing me close to God, stop reading it. Let's get on our knees before the Lord and get in the right relationship and let the Bible then mean something to us. Don't you think? Otherwise, Randall does us no good, don't you think? Except make us more responsible. It does do that, right? <laughs> and that's not a good thing. So there's a rhema when God spoke and created things. There's a rhema when God brought the flood. Peter's calling them, as he said, remember the rhemas. It's important as he moves forward that uh, but the heavens and the earth now present by the same word of God, the ramus, see, are being reserved for fire, having been kept for a day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. God spoke about it. The rhema of God has come and warned about what's coming, lest we forget the rhema. That's Peter's point. But beloved, this one thing must not escape you. That one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. See, time goes by and we forget about the ramas and what God has said. And instead of seeing the patience of God in that, we think nothing's going to happen. When God, by nature, is patient. Isn't that right, Michael? Thank God that he is. He is patient. And his patience is, as we will see here, unto something. Beloved, this one thing must not escape you, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some consider slowness. The rhemas of God will come to pass. But he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that anyone should perish. And thus Peter explains, according to God's nature, he explains the scenario. God is patient. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Can you say amen and thank God for that? It's not the Lord sitting back, not doing something. He is patient, and he is working. We'll go back to 1 Peter 3 and see that in a moment more clearly. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing anyone to perish, but for all but for all conceivable men to come to repentance. 
But the day of the Lord will come. See, the rhemas will come to fulfillment. What God has said and now what is written will come to fulfillment. Because the Lord is the Logos who speaks the rhema. And he is the living word. And when the rhemas come forth from the living word, they are filled with his plan, purpose, his life, what he wants. In fact, most of the rhemas of God are along that line of purpose. They are not random. They are not about small things, the rhemas he's talking about here. There's rhemas and then there's rhemas. And these rhemas are of a quality of for entire humanity and are meant to affect, to affect the course of God's people and the course of the entire world. That's the rhemas that Peter has in view. Right? That's the whole context of this. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements being burned up will be destroyed. Both the earth and the works in it will be consumed by fire. In other words, according to what Peter has been saying in 1 Peter chapter 3, now again in 2 Peter chapter 3, another event, let's say it that way, it's more than that, according to God's destruction of the entire earth like in the days of Noah. This is not limited dynamic of AD 70. This is the entire earth being viewed. And the context is clear about it, is it not? You cannot cram this into AD 70 and one little thing that happened in a land called Israel in Judea in the, in the city of Jerusalem. This is a worldwide destruction being spoken of again. Amen? I know most of us in this room are not doubting that, but there are people who do. Consequently, all these things being destroyed, and what kind of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godly acts, expecting and eagerly desiring the arrival of the day of God, because of which the heavens Bring on, being on fire will be destroyed and the elements being burned up are melted. But according to his promise, we expect a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen. So let's go on. Therefore, uh, making every effort to be found blameless. Beloved, while expecting these things, you must make every effort, notice, to be found blameless by him in peace, spotless and blameless. blameless. That's looking at a bridal condition, isn't it? In fact, you must regard the, here it is again, the patience of our Lord as for salvation. Again, how do we see, people say, well, there's delay, there's patience. Delay is caused by man. Patience is the, is the very character of God. Right? Man delays his own salvation, his own deliverance. God is patient, not willing that any should perish. And God is patient in that he is doing a work. Is that not true? Yeah. Two things are happening. Patience allows the loss more time, but more importantly, patience allows a vessel to be made ready. Let me say it again. Patience allows the loss to come in, but more importantly, patience allows the vessel to be made ready. And when the vessel is made ready, the end comes. There's the principle. What principle is that, Terry? The principle of time. The principle of time is God wants a vessel, and nothing is ending until he gets it. And so time itself, hear me, is bound up with a vessel. You take that as far as you want to. Us being sent to the rest of the creation. I'm saying to the outer space regions is contingent upon a vessel. It cannot happen until there is a ready vessel. I'm quoting Ephesians 4. 
that Christ may fill the universe. We are the vessels of that. Cannot happen until that vessel is ready. Time itself is bound to the vessel. God is not random. Time is not greater than the vessel. Time depends upon the vessel. And when the vessel appear, time itself is shifted. I hope that helps our hearts. Then we can uh, look for and hasten, right? Right. By being made ready. Amen. See, the, the church is bought into the lie that God is allowing. God doesn't allow anything and tell me in no uncertain terms and an open rebuke to me. I'm not allowing anything, son. You are, not me. I am patient and I'm long-suffering. Those are character traits of mine. Allowing is not a character trait. I am working and you can't see it. Thus are the rebukes of the Lord to me. Wrong word, allowing. It implicates God as if he's sitting back allowing while doing nothing. He is patient and he is working. That is the right attitude, understanding of who our God actually is. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Guys, he's not back there twiddling his thumbs saying, oh boy, <laughs> that is not what's going on. I guess I'll allow this for a little longer. No, no, no. Well, as we will see from the scriptures themselves, when the vessel is made ready, then the end comes. So the vessel, the vessel again, determines time. Let's go on. Therefore, beloved, while, expe while expecting these things, have we lost that expectation? It's been battled, don't you think? Oh, it's just going to go on forever. It will not. Uh, let's just say in this room, what if we all decide to be wholeheartedly towards the, wholehearted towards the Lord? Let me give you another concept of the vessel determining time. Second Chronicles 16, verse number 9. For the eyes of the Lord search, roam throughout the entire earth, looking for those who are wholeheartedly his. See what determines what? God's after a vessel. He is forever after a vessel. He couldn't have Moses until he could have Moses. There was no Moses before Moses, or there would have been a Moses before Moses. He's got to have the vessel. Amen? So it's even bigger than that, but let's, let's go on here. Um, in fact, you must regard the patience of our Lord as for salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, notice the context of this, all right, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom having been given to him, wrote to you. Um, Peter's being specific here, not general, with the writings of Paul. He's being specific that Paul has written things about the end and they're hard to understand. That's the context. It's not a general context. Oh, Paul writes hard things. That would not be correct as to the context of this passage. Peter's saying just as I'm writing things about the end, and let's just back up a second and let me repeat again. You guys are forgotten the ramas. That's basically what Peter's saying to them. Don't do it. Maybe we've forgotten to respect Ramus. Maybe we've forgotten how to properly discern Ramus from the Spirit of Christ in us. Life in the Spirit, relationship in the Spirit, hearing the voice of God inwardly by the Spirit. For every believer, not the few, the proud, the chosen, the whatever, the Marines, <laughs> not the gifted. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about knowing the Lord inwardly, knowing the voice of the Lord inwardly. That's for every believer. It's called life in the Spirit. God's voice is more clear and loud from within than any audible voice from without, even though we respect the audible voice. Few are going to hear the audible voice, but everyone, everyone, say it again, everyone can hear in life in the Spirit that inward witness of the Spirit, that inward voice of God we are meant to. It's called life in the Spirit. Right? 
In former times, God was only speaking through the prophets and speaking to the prophets, generally speaking. In these times, something else is going on from within because Christ is in us. God the Father is in you. God the Spirit is inside of you. We will come and make our home inside of you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Something better is going on from within. God is speaking to us from within. We must learn to discern that voice over all other voices. And if we will go there with him, he will lead us and teach us. And when he speaks ramas, we will properly discern and know what, whether it's God or not. Amen? Sound like a plan? It's a good plan, isn't it? The Lord knows what he's doing. Already people know the voice of God from within, and they recognize the truth of a God rhema. And when it's not a God rhema, they recognize that as well. Amen. Isn't that right? Well, I'm sure I'm uh, preaching to the choir here, but let me preach to the choir. I know these things have been said by Ken and, and by Brian, but uh, I'm, if anything else, confirming what they've been saying. Right? Which is good. So, but I'm doing more than that. I'm coming at it from the scriptures as to the importance of what Paul was saying was, was uh, hard to understand. He was saying somewhat different and more than what Peter was saying about the future. According to the wisdom having been given to him. It's like uh, Revelation 10, right? Hello? There was a wisdom given to Paul and he was responsible for that wisdom. And it's like Revelation 10 when uh, John's told to go ask for that little book in the hand of that angel. Would you give me the little book? That little book represents his part in the fulfillment of the scroll, the bigger scroll, called the book of Revelation. And uh, John takes the little book, the angel gives it to him, he takes the part he has in the fulfillment of the book of Revelation and he eats it, right? And is told, then you must prophesy again. So what he is doing is there's part of the book of Revelation that John has a part in, it's fulfillment and purpose, right? Not all of it, but his part in proclamation of it. So he takes the little scroll, he eats it, and is told, you must prophesy again. Indeed he did, and will. Paul did his part. Peter's doing his part. We don't want to go beyond the boundaries, but we don't want to miss the will of God in this either, right? As also in all of his letters, speaking in them concerning these things, what things concerning the end? In which are some things hard to understand, which things the ignorant and unstable twist as also the other scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing beforehand, you must guard yourselves, lest that having been led away by the error of lawless ones, you may fall from your own steadfastness. It's patience unto the coming of the Lord. God is patient. You know, patience is a beautiful thing. As we can tell, it gives people time to repent. It did in the days of Noah. But the Lord said something to me, a little question he asked me, and a statement as well he made to me about the days of Noah. And, and I never heard this brought up before uh, from the Lord. I'm sure others have heard it. I haven't. But he asked me, uh, so what was I doing in that hundred years with Noah and his family? That's the real key to understanding God was making Noah and his family ready to enter that ark as we must be made ready. Looking into that a little bit deeper, every day that Noah drove with a hammer spikes into the ark while building that ark, something was going on in Noah. I'm just looking at one area. There's multiple areas of God working in Noah. It is said of Noah, by the way, right, that he was a righteous man. If so, and that's true, and I'm looking at both Genesis and Hebrews 11, both, then he is like Abel. One of 
one of the sons of God. It is also said that he walked with God. And if true, he is like Enoch, one of the sons of God. Those two qualities are found in Noah. But God's not just going to have a partial work with any of us. He's going to bring us to full readiness. That's the vessel he's after. It's a good beginning, right? Wouldn't you say? He's a righteous man. The comparison with Abel is clear. He recognizes that he had no good thing in him. His best will not be pleasing to God. Abel knew that, didn't he? Did he not? Cain was the deceived one, and it was a willing deception like what Peter's talking about here. He knew the right order of things from his mom and his dad that you were to offer in the sacrifices specifically you're to offer what we now know is a type in those times or a shadow of Christ. You're to offer Christ back to God. He's the only pleasing sacrifice. You cannot offer your best. Is that not right? Hello? It is right, isn't it? So, uh, and we understand that for Noah... He is a righteous man. He is offering to God the right sacrifice, Christ. And he's walking with God like Enoch did. And because Enoch walked with God, God took him. And God's going to take Noah in the ark. To rescue him. So that the waters that destroy will be the waters of their salvation not in washing away the filth of their sin, but in a recognition that they are in a God consciousness before God and not, do not possess any longer an evil conscience. And it is that issue of conscience which is a part of our spirit being, is it not? Hello? The voice of God, conscience, relationship, with God, threefoldness of life in the Spirit. The ability to hear the voice of God, God consciousness verifying that it is God, that it's right and good and not evil. That's how God consciousness is meant to work. Is that not right? In the relationship with God. Life in the Spirit. The soul is different, right? Right? Mind, human reasoning, the human will, and the emotions under man's control and not God's. The will of man versus the will of God. But life in the spirit is the voice of God from within. Some people use the word intuition. I hate that word. It's not an intuitive issue. It is simply speaking Christ in us, God the Father in us, and God the Spirit in us means that God is speaking to us from within. I know, I'm sorry, I know that, uh, I'm sure they appreciated that comment I just made, by the way. Some of the old timers who I greatly respect and love and appreciate who have gone on to be with the Lord use that word intuitiveness. But I think it's an improper word. I don't like it. It's not an ap application. We're talking about the voice of a person, God inside of us speaking, who lives in us now, right? 1 Corinthians 6, 17, those who have joined themselves to the Lord are one spirit with him now. God is in you. He'd be not far from any of us if you, we'd be born again. He's in us. Amen. He's taking up president. So, so uh, it is quite the rewiring, by the way, but worth it to go on this journey with God and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be able to discern the will of God from within, right? Through consciousness. And his voice. That combination of conscious and the voice of God are a powerful combination. Right? In the relationship. Okay, so uh, let's go a little bit further. So um, 
I wanted to see here really, I guess, four steps. Um, and maybe for time's sake, we won't um, look at all of them in Genesis. You'll know them anyway when I bring them up. But uh, before I do, I, I want to just look at something. Uh, a quote of scripture in Luke chapter 21, verse number 19. By your patience or steadfastness, you will gain your souls. When you look at James chapter 5, right? Remember the patience of Job. Remember that statement? We're being called to remember a quality, the fruit of the Spirit to operate in us. And one of, that, one of the main fruits being spoken of in this instance is a God trait, a God uh, attribute, eternally speaking, of patience. Another one would be long-suffering. So Luke 21, 19, by your steadfastness or patience, you will gain your souls. I can say this as we look at the times that we are in, and we can turn to the book of Revelation and uh, read it. This calls for the patience or the endurance of the saints, the perseverance of the saints, steadfastness of the saints. All those words are applicable. They apply. We need an inward work of the Lord as to him establishing himself in us. I do. In patience, and that's how it works. This is not uh, give me more patience. It's an increase of the Lord we're after, relationally speaking, right? You receive more of the Lord, and then you have more of him who is patient. Is that not true? If you can have anything of God outside from God coming in and being that, you have a false religion. God gives himself. He is that. He's not giving something like patience. He's giving himself. He is that. Amen? Isn't he glorious? Isn't he wonderful? He's quite marvelous, don't you think? And uh, loving, he offers himself to us freely. Believe and receive in him. All that he is. So, now, in the Genesis story, there are four points. I'm just going to name them. You will know them. So four things I want us to see before the judgment in that time. But what I want us to really see is four, I'm going to reverse psychology it. <laughs> four steps to readiness as seen in these four things. <laughs> They're the negative in Genesis. They can be the positive for us. Okay. So first, and their eyes were opened. That's the first one. Spoken concerning Adam and his wife, right? Uh, God did not want them to, tr to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The lie of Satan was that in the day that you eat it, you will become like God. That's not true. You know that God does not have an experiential knowledge of evil? He has never committed evil. That's what he was barring them from and was the test and the, they fell. They now had an experiential knowledge of evil. They had become evil themselves, disobedient to God. God knows about evil, but he doesn't know evil in a relational way in an experiential way. God has never been evil. In him, there is no darkness, only light. Amen? Amen? And so the Lord wanted to spare them. He wanted them to be his. They acted, and here's the birth in man, not in creation, because Lucifer was the first, but here's the birth in man of the independent spirit. They will act independently of God and make their own choice and determine their own way their own truth, and their own life. So the independent spirit now enters the man and the woman. They are going to act independently of God. Right? So let's flip that around. What's readiness mean? Never acting independently of God. God crushing the independent spirit within us. 
There's all kinds of examples. You know that Jesus Christ, it says so, never acted independently. He did only that which he saw his father doing. And he spoke only that which he heard his father speaking. Remember the time they were going up to the feast? And come up to the feast. It's his brothers who don't believe in him, by the way. Come up to the feast with us. I'm not going up to the feast. And then after they left, he went up to the feast. <laughs> now what's going on there? We have to have a higher view of this than a low view says, well, he's playing games with them. He was not. He was waiting for his father to speak. And if his father didn't tell him to go, he wouldn't go. That's what's going on. And we're meant to live that way? Now, you may take that to a very low place, like going to work in the morning. <laughs> I haven't heard the father speak about going to work in the morning. You never will. <laughs> Hopefully the father spoke when he gave you the job. Now go. <laughs> Got to have a little fun with this. You know what I mean, guys? We humans are looking for an out. <laughs> so the independent spirit is the original sin with man, right? Act independently of God's will. Now people say, well, God spoke to the man, not to the woman, but Genesis 1 will disagree with you when it says that God spoke to them, including the tree, about the tree. I've actually heard people say God never spoke to Eve about that tree, but he did. Now, did God uh, also speak to Adam it should not have Adam reminded Eve of what God had spoken? Well, absolutely. There's a grave responsibility on a man who will not bring up what God has said, the rhema of God, when everything is in the balance. Right? Where's Adam's voice? Hey, sweetie, remember that rhema. Don't eat of that tree. <laughs> Don't you think, brother? Don't do it. And don't listen to the lie. All right, so first is their eyes were open. So let our eyes be open to the Lord now, clearly about the what's in us as an independent spirit. We're going to choose our way. We're going to choose our truth, and we're going to choose our life. And Christ is meant to be all three, the way, the truth, and the life. You know, you talk this way in the church nowadays and people think you're crazy. There's a legitimate thing called waiting on the Lord and Jesus exemplified that over and over and over again. He would not answer to man before God and his answer to man would be from God. He would speak that which the Father was speaking to him. His soul for 30 years before his ministry began, God had hammered this point home through testing to bring Christ's soul, because the divine spirit never had a soul, till Christ becomes a man. And for 30 years, Christ was tested along these lines of the human soul until the human soul was brought into full subjection to God. He never in those 30 years, or the three and a half afterwards, acted out of his own independent will, out of his own soul. Say, well, that's him, not me. He's in us. And so is God the Father. And so is God the Spirit. And what is not possible with us, naturally, is completely possible with them in us, spiritually. And we need to make that distinction again. It is way too easy to say, well, I'm just human. You have Christ living in you. <laughs> you have God the Father living in you. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Let me ask you a question. Has God, and I'm going to say hands, how many in this room has ever had God deliver them from something? Then why can't he deliver you of everything? What's the hold up? I, I can answer that because I know what y'all know. I'm one of you. Me. <laughs> no, it's three people. Me, myself, and I. <laughs> it's 
that unholy trinity inside of us, don't you think? That's the real problem, me, myself, and I. <laughs> if God can deliver us from one thing, what else can't he deliver us from, folks? Come on. The devil would lie to us. Oh, you're just going to be bound by that forever. That's no different than his lie to Eve. You're going to be missing something here if you don't eat of this. This will make you like God. A fallen one, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, I spent a lot of time on that, didn't I? Secondly, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. The story is that Cain refused. Now listen, Cain believed in God, and he believed God alone was the sole object of worship. Y'all with me? Please hear me. Cain believed in God. Cain believed that God was the sole object. So object of worship, sole object of worship. I'll get that out. It's usually not a tongue twister. But he would not follow the way of Christ as Abel did. Abel knew that in him dwelt no good thing. I cannot present any good thing of myself to God. I can only present what God has prescribed. And that's what Abel did. He presented Christ. He presented blood, a sacrifice. Cain presented the best that he could produce, which is completely unacceptable to God. Then why all this talk in Christianity of give God your best? We don't have such a creature in us <laughs> other than Christ. <laughs> give God your best. Why? So he can throw up on it too? <laughs> you might as well give him your worst. There's no different to him. You offer to God Christ. That's the only thing he will accept. That's the real point of it, is it not? Abel did just that. Why is it so hard for us to realize that there's no good thing that dwells in us? That we can offer Christ and keep offering Christ. And let Christ so possess us that he comes up out of us, a sweet-smelling aroma to the Father. So with Cain, it's independent worship of God with his own thoughts, his own way, his own truth, his own life, and his best. So how does that speak to us? To come back to be true worshipers in spirit and in truth. For God is seeking such worshipers. God is not speaking, seeking worship. He never has and he never will. He is seeking worshipers. And worshipers who will bow to him. What if Eve would have proven to be a true worshiper and bowed to the will of God rather than her own soul and the temptation she was under? Worship has us bowing to God, not the devil. Worship has us bowing to God, not our own thoughts, not our own ways, not our own plans, not our own will, not our own anything. True worship is an action of not following our way, but God's, and that is true worship. And God is seeking true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. The truth is a person and his name is Jesus. And the spirit being spoken of is the spirit of God. Amen. So we can thus be a people that do not go out from the presence of the Lord, but allow the presence of the Lord to inhabit us. Right? Right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a possessed people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Thus that people show forth the excellencies of the Lord. Not what they, like Cain, have been able to produce. The Lord gets glorified. And more specifically, he's glorified in this way. He has conquered us, and we now willingly belong to him. We are his, and it's a love relationship, not a duty. Right? 
So what if, in readiness, we re renounce, renounce the independent spirit within us? Every way that it flares up and God allows, to say it this way, these things around us to bring us to where it shows itself. The test is brought so that it will show itself. It's independent. And the Lord says, okay, that's an independent spirit in you operating. I want to take that from you. Put it away forever. You renounce it. I'll deal with it. What if we don't stop this going out of the presence of the Lord by independent worship? But instead... I mean, our own thoughts, our own ways, what we can produce. Instead, we become true worshipers in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, for the Father seeks such. Now third, another statement here, fourfold statement before the flood, before the judgment, what brought the judgment. That's what I'm looking at. It's fourfold. The sons of God unite with the daughters of men. Now let's just stick to the scriptures and stay out of fantasy. God had kicked Cain out. Y'all know that? Get out. Cain says, my judgment is too much. Wherever I go, people are going to want to kill me. Now, had a human been on the throne, me particularly, it would have been like, so? <laughs> Maybe that's what you deserve. You murdered your brother. <laughs> but aren't you glad that it's not a man on the throne other than Christ? <laughs> right? So the sons of God unite with the daughters of men. Here's what's going on. There's a godly line. We talked a little bit about him. Enoch, Abel. Genesis chapter 4, in speaking of what Cain did, is followed. You look at it. Genesis, what we call Genesis chapter 4. After Cain murders and Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord, then the line of Cain is spoken about in Genesis 4. The line of Cain. Let me show you the difference between the line of Cain and the line of well, we say Adam, but really dealing with the sons of God. Lamech. There's a Lamech in the line of Cain. Is there not? What does that Lamech say? Y'all remember? Y'all want, want to read it again? Want to look at it? Let's look at it in Genesis. It's quite interesting. You can tell the, the ungodliness of Cain's line. That Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord. Hear what I'm about to say, and what does Cain do? God says to Cain, you're going to be a wanderer. Cain goes out and builds a city. Direct disobedience. He builds a civilization, the one we're presently living in. Destroyed in the flood, but brought back all over again, the way of Cain. What's around us is the way of Cain, guys. That could not dwell with God. He put it out, sent it away. So anyway, let's look at this for a little bit. It's interesting, this bloodline in Genesis chapter 4 of the line of Cain. And so there's an Enoch, right? Isn't that just like the enemy? to confuse the issue. There's an Enoch in the line of Cain, and there's a godly Enoch in the line of the sons of God. Godly people, some of them at least. But I want to get to, uh, there's also someone named like Methuselah, but who fathered Lamech, and Lamech took two wives for himself. This is Genesis chapter 4. One named Ida and the other Zilhah. And Ida bore Jabel. He was the father of the nomadic herdsmen. So what's going on? The civilization is being built through Cain. None of this is spoken. Not a single bit of it is spoken from the godly line. 
Theirs is given over to the Lord. This is, they're filling the earth with evil conscience, manifesting itself in a civilization. His brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who play the lyre and the flute. Ever wonder why music, generally speaking, is predominantly used for evil? It doesn't make music itself evil. What I'm telling you is music would have come on the scene without Cain. But Cain brought something typical of sin ahead of schedule. Not of God, not produced by God, but produced by the will of man. Can you hear what I'm saying? Brought on by the will of man, not the will of God. This whole civilization here is brought on by the will of man. He's the father of all who played the lyre and the flute. Zilhah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Again, what's wrong with bronze and iron tools? Nothing except when you have an evil conscience and you're going to murder people. <laughs> going to start wars. Again, independent spirit. Not proper worship of God, not bowing to God, but bowing to their own will, their own destiny, their own way, their own truth, their own life. And you produce a civilization. Can you hear what I'm saying? You produce a civilization. And what's God going to do with that civilization? He's going to send a flood and wipe the whole thing out. That's what he's going to do. That's why I'm giving you the four steps to destruction so that we will be ready in the opposite of these four things. Yes. Thus, we see the enlarged version of what Jesus said and what Peter is talking about as it was in the days of Noah. Amen. All right, so Zilhah, who bore Tubal Cain, who bore all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama, and Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilhah, Hear my voice. I don't think we have a rhema going on here. <laughs> what do y'all think? Something other than that's going on. Wives of Lamech. If I would have been the wives, I had, would have gone on a lasting vacation over to where the sons of God lived. I'd have been out of there. <laughs> this, game, this man's crazy. Pay attention to my words, for I killed a man for wounding me. How would you like to tell you why I was listening to this? <laughs> I killed a man for wounding me. I'm sure the wives were like, <laughs> jaw drops down to the floor, eyes bug out of their head. You did what? Of course, what they're really thinking is, and he don't respect us either. Right? And why did I say yes when I said, should have said no? <laughs> At the wedding, that is. <laughs> Instead of saying I do, I don't. <laughs> if Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech it will be 77 times. Now there's a murderer. Now there's a Lamech in the godly line. He's the father of Noah, the son of Methuselah. Notice how in this line of Cain, nobody's age is mentioned. That's just how little God thinks about it. That's what we're dealing with with the, the daughters of men come from this line right here. So, again, the sons of God then, notice, hear what I'm trying to say about our time. They unite. In fact, <clears throat> you know, we can read it specifically. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose. Notice independent spirit there. You see that, Michael? Any they chose. God's not in the picture. The sons of God are no longer listening to God. They're making their own choices now. 
Independent spirit has come in, brother. What do you think about that? Here it is. They chose as wives for themselves. They chose them from an ungodly line. It means to be joined when two are married into one. And they unite themselves to one with an evil conscience people. with a murdering bloodline. They had lived separately. This is historically accurate. They had lived separately up to this time. They held, the sons of God held a promise of God. They held a rhema. And you know what that rhema was? That rhema was to their, the, the original woman from you. He will come. And it's he who will crush the serpent's head. And they had believed that rhema and had kept themselves separated to God because of it. But now, some of them, I don't know how many are said here, but it ends up bad, are going to unite themselves, Randall. They're going to wed. They're going to marry. They're going to become one, flesh. Hear me. The two shall become one flesh, right? Thus, the end of all flesh has come up before me. When the two unite and become one flesh and the testimony of God is taken out of the way, the judgment of God is not far behind. So Cain's forbidden line then becomes united in marriage with what at one time, one point, was those who believed in the rhema of God and kept themselves accordingly, just bringing Peter back into view again. And the Lord said, in that context of them marrying, my spirit will not always remain with mankind because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. He's naming the time of the flood. That's not how long they're going to live. He is naming how long they will live until the flood comes. 120 years from this point, the flood is going to come, basically. That's what's being said. So anyway, we're looking then ahead and back, both. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards. Then the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. And it is, rightly said, it is this union and the offspring of this union that brings it to a point. Again, we're dealing with humans here. Uh, Angels don't have sperm. And Jesus makes that exceptionally clear. Angels don't reproduce. It is impossible for them to do so. You will be like the angels who do not marry or nor are given in marriage. Right? Right. Angels are created. They are not birthed. Nor can they birth. They are incorporeal beings. They do not have a physical body. Amen? Amen? You understand? So uh, what's produced out of this are mighty leaders. In what way? In evil. They have an evil conscience. And that's what's filling the earth now. When the Lord saw that the human wickedness was widespread on the earth, notice that every inclination of the human mind, these are humans, says so twice here, one verse, They're not a mixture. They're not some variant. They are pure human. And and by the way, the judgments are going to come upon the human. Every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. 
the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And he was deeply grieved. And the Lord said, I will wipe mankind out whom I have created off the face of the earth together with the animals and the creatures that crawl and the birds of the sky. <clears throat> For I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. And so I want to bring all this together unless we be here the rest of the night. So man's conscience was so evil that every thought, it says, was of evil. That's how evil everything had become. Again, let's go back through that. From their eyes were open. There's the beginning, right? Independent spirit. What's the result? Is it a minor thing to act independent of God? Look how it progresses. It never stops with that. It always progresses. If it's not repented of, it's submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We refuse to submit to God, resist the devil. If we continue in our independent spirit, there will be severe consequences. Not only in this life, but in eternity. The eyes of them were opened, independent spirit. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, independent worship. Sons of God, unite with man, independent choice, independent uniting, independent oneness. We'll have what God doesn't want. We will have mixture. We will mix the two bloodlines. And it ends with the end of all flesh. Man's conscience is so seared that it's only an evil conscience, except for Noah. You could say the eight, but the Bible's actually saying Noah. There were eight of them, but God's talking about Noah. Noah becomes the messenger of God. He has the rhema. And what is that rhema? Well, that's several fold. There's several of them involved in this. God's going to destroy the whole earth. He has it. He hears it. He knows it. And I've got to build an ark. Thank God for rhemas. If I didn't know that the Lord wasn't going to destroy the, earth, the world by water again, I'd be building one, and probably all of us in here would be as well. <laughs> right now in our time. With what's going on, right? It's not hard to see it. No, so God, now let me step back and say, so how's another part of this key? I'll, I'll try to finish up, talk more about this tomorrow night, but how is it then that uh, this is so important, Terry? Let me tell you a little bit more of why I believe it's so important. Um, what would have happened had the sons of God not decided to do what they did? No flood, that's what. But it's even deeper than that. Had the sons of God stayed true, Christ would have come 3,000 years before he did, right into their midst, the first time. What would that mean? That would be, mean 3,000 years of people not going to hell. That's what it would mean. Where are you getting this from? The Lord said it right to me. And I've never heard anybody say it. So I'm giving you a rhema. It's a correction to me. 3,000 plus years because the sons of God didn't stay true. They had the promised rhema from your line to the woman, Messiah is going to come. And uh, the serpent will bruise his foot, his heel. But he, the Lord, will crush his head. Does it mean something to stay true? You better believe it does. Is Satan fighting us on that point? Well, it doesn't really matter. It matters. Bring it right into our time. Four thousand year delay, at least a three thousand year delay. 
God wanted his son to come the first time way before 4,000 years. The nature of God would tell us that clearly. He didn't have the vessel. What vessel, Terry? 12 men, that vessel. Go back and reread everything. Because on that vessel is going to be laid by Christ the entire beginnings of the church. You think that's a significant vessel? You better believe it is. And he didn't have it for 4,000 years. And he could have. And he should have. And so delay. Disobedience always brings delay. God's will missed. Our way, our truth, our life always brings delay. Independent spirit always will bring delay. Worship according to our own minds, our own wills, our own desires, instead of bowing to him will always bring delay. And now, after 4,000 years, the Lord is able to come because God in his foreknowledge knows there's going to be 12 men who will respond because there wasn't going to be before. And so his son comes. And that's going to be followed by an apostle named Paul. Is that not right? It's going to be followed by men and women who are going to say yes to him. But now we've gone from the need of that vessel to the need of a bride. And we've been 2,000 years in delay because he can't get a bride ready. He can do it. We won't allow it. It matters. Beautiful words there in Revelation 19, and the bride has made herself ready. So, um, I'll continue with this <laughs> tomorrow night, which may be a warning. I don't know. <laughs> Guys, as for me, I do not want to be the cause of more delay. How about you? I refuse to accept, and, and, and there's so much more I want to talk about in this, but this is the re revelation of uh, God as it comes to the messenger. And I'll talk about Brian for a moment. As it comes to the messenger, the messenger who's hearing that revelation, hearing that uh, what is spoken of in the Greek, here is, as you know, Peter is talking about it, that rhema. You see, the rhema comes to the messenger. That messenger is driven from within. There's got to be a people made ready. You know that? Isn't that right? Want to say that again? Rhema comes to the messenger. They have not deduced it from the word of God. They have heard it from the Lord himself. Or they heard it from an angel sent to them from the Lord himself, Right? And suddenly that messenger is aware. Okay, this is the what, here, here's what the Lord wants and this is the will of God. And when that happens, please hear what I'm about to say. I'll talk more about it tomorrow night. But when that happens, that sets that messenger over and against the whole culture of Cain. Even if it's in the church. Don't make them popular. It makes them a target to demons to religious people, to just people. I want you to see Brian in a whole new light as I see him. He is a messenger of the Lord. He has heard a rhema from the Lord, multiple ones actually. And his purpose, he may feel like, I get it. I, you know, I may be more intense than him. I don't know who's more intense. So we're not in a competition about it. You know, he doesn't deliver the message uh, in the way some people like the message delivered so they can sleep through it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm not speaking to you guys. I'm speaking about the live streamers. <laughs> no, I get it. The messenger sets himself before the Lord, and uh, there's a fire shut up inside of them. God deserves to have what he wants, and he has spoken about it and declared it to me. And I can't help. It's like Jeremiah. Something shut up in my bones and I can't help speak. I tried to be quiet. That's what Jeremiah has to say. You ever fought that battle? I do all the time. I pray prayers. Lord, please, when I get up this morning, don't let me be so intense. <laughs> Seriously. I prayed those prayers. Everybody else was too. <laughs> we were finally in agreement. <laughs> and the Lord will do it what he wants. So anyway, whether it's intense or not, I, I don't mean that's just an action, but there's an intensity to fire. How many know that? Put your hand in it and say that your action will be quite intense as well as what happens to your skin if it's not covered. So the messenger is suddenly at odds with the whole world and mostly the whole world of the church. <laughs> Every demon... And it becomes a testimony of the Lord's greatness only in a human vessel. A flawed human vessel, which we all are. A human vessel desperately in need of Jesus Christ, which we all do. Amen? But I want to describe to you then when the rhema comes, and the rhema's coming in our time again, God is speaking, and he's speaking about the times, and he's speaking as to his will. And while much of the church is asleep or even worse, resistant, mocking, scoffing at even the thought of the coming of the Lord, there are some who have ears to hear what the Spirit is actually saying so that we could say it this way, then in their inward man, life in the Spirit is real and being realized with them. And they know from within, the voice of God from within, that that is the word of the Lord. That is a rhema of God, and I'm going to respond to what I just heard. I'm not saying the Lord's speaking to them. I'm saying the Lord's speaking through Brian. God's not sending Gabriel to everybody. He's sending Gabriel to a few. And everybody else will have to have life in the spirit to know whether it's Gabriel being, that's Gabriel, really Gabriel or not. And that is the way of God. And we might not like it, but it's true. Gabriel came to Zechariah. Gabriel came to Mary. Where's everybody else? Gabriel came to Daniel. That's how God works. So Gabriel hadn't come to me. He's not going to either. But that doesn't mean you can't hear what the message is. It doesn't mean we shouldn't hear what the message is. Does it really matter? All Gabriel's coming means that uh, your life's about to be crap. You're in trouble. Because <laughs> where there was once friends, now there will be enemies. Right? That's what I was trying to say. We Americans have such an independent spirit and try, pride ourselves on it that Gabriel's got to be spent to us, sent to us and when he's not coming. Don't look for him because he's not coming to you. If he shows up, great, but I'm telling you, he's not. <laughs> I was never so surprised when he came to me. I had to make sure, are you talking to me? <laughs> Not really, but why am I saying all this? I want us to get into divine order. The house of God has to come to order. You have to understand how God speaks, and he has a history of it. And God will raise up a Moses, and everybody's going to have to listen to him. You're going to have to be able to discern whether that's the Lord or not. And it has nothing to do with our souls. It has to do with life in the spirit. Not our likes, not our dislikes on how somebody says it. It has nothing to do with it. Whether it's monotone or loud, low key or, you know, barely, you know, a stand it 
your hair's blowing back. <laughs> All those are human things. That's a reaction of the vessel. But it's what's being said that's important. So uh, I would remind us, as Peter does, to not forget the Ramus in our time. God does not waste his words. Gabriel does not come without it being a big thing. Don't you think? That angel is a messenger angel. He's much more than that. He's a birthing angel. It's proven to be so in God, how God created him and how God uses him. He's also a warring angel. So a lot in these days, there's a lot of mocking. and There's a lot of scoffing. And there's a lot of questioning when there should be enough life in the spirit in the body of Christ to discern what is the voice of God? What is the rhema? And what is actually going on? Don't you think? I ask God to fast forward our training as concerning life in the spirit to where he will begin to teach us how to hear him, hear him from within and how to separate our soul voice and the voice of others from the voice of God within us. How many would say that's a good work and it needs to be done in our time? I agree with that. Amen. So let's stand up. I'm going to pray that over us. I'm going to pray that Gabriel comes to every one of us. That way, if you get in a fight, you know, you both can argue about the same thing. He did not come to you. Yes, he did. No, no, no. He came to me, not you. <laughs> I'm messing around. Now, I'm going to pray this. I want to pray that life in the spirit becomes real and that we... I'm for visions and I'm for dreams, but there's something much more deep and much more real relationally than that. Those are actually outward forms of communication. I'm for them, but there's a deep inward personal that's meant to be an intimate form of relationship and communication called life in the spirit. It is hearing the voice of God from within. The sense the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are now living in the believer inside of us, in heaven and in you. That's <laughs> Right? Omnipresent. So I'm asking, Lord, now for that life in the spirit reality of the voice of God from within, of good or God conscience that couples to the voice and understands if it's God or not, what we're hearing. A good conscience will say, that's the Lord. That is needed. In the relationship, we're asking for the inward voice of God to become clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. Teach us, Lord. Train us, Lord, how to respond rightly to your inward voice. To the discernment of a good conscience that understands God versus evil. Truth versus a lie, right? Life versus death. There's conscious working rightly as God has given it to our spirit. I ask for all of us here in this, Lord, every one of us are meant to inwardly hear your voice. Every one of us, thank you, Lord, for that. You say your sheep know your voice, and it's that inward voice. So teach me, Lord, teach me. Pray it's not easier to hear Gabriel than it is the inward voice, but I'm afraid it is. because of being geared to the outward rather than the inward. If the church has life in the spirit, we would know the time we're in. And our conscience would verify the truth of it, the life of it, in the relationship. 
and there would be no argument and no delay. So we are asking for that tonight. Everyone here, everyone who's going to listen. I just say of my own heart, Lord, be open wide in the spirit to you. To not only come in, but to establish yourself. Your voice louder than mine. Your voice louder than others' voices. To bring your conscious, a God conscious into us. To discern good and evil. Truth versus a lie. Life versus death. I ask for that for all of us tonight, Lord Jesus. Do that work. I ask that you would revitalize our time with you by the inward voice of the Lord. Reveal yourself, Lord. Talk to us about yourself. We want to hear. We want to learn and we want to become. Be transformed by the one we're learning from into your likeness in life, Lord. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Terry. That was really, really, really good. Very timely. Yeah, everybody just be seated just for a minute. Um, I don't know that you need me to say this, but I really feel to do that, is that this really is a... Time, I know it is for our fellowship, and I, and I believe it is. I don't believe you're here by accident, and those watching online, I don't believe you're watching by accident. But I really do know, believe and know, that this is a really timely word uh, from the Lord. And I think we're only at the beginning of hearing all that God wants to say this weekend. Uh, I know that uh, Alice back there and part of our fellowship had a word for us uh, a month or so ago that we had reached a plateau in our journey uh, toward readiness. And what I believe is Terry was speaking, and I, I've got to go back and watch it again and, and glean a lot more of the detail of that. But what I'm really sensing uh, is that this weekend can be a real breakthrough to take us wherever you are. If you've leveled in your pursuit of, of readiness, uh, this can be a time of breakthrough to catapult us to a new level and new heights and new pursuit. And so, anyway, that's my prayer for uh, this weekend, that it would be a time where God would really bring us off this plateau uh, onto that uh, fresh journey of pr the pursuit of being that vessel. I know that I want to be that, and you want to be that as well. We want to be that vessel made ready, that bride made ready, so that the Lord can come back. Amen? Amen. All right. We'll close with uh, taking up the offering. Uh, and uh, so our usher is going to come forward uh, to do that. Uh, if you'd like to give online, especially those who are watching online, if you'd like to give online, you can go to our uh, church website. Uh, restorationlife.org uh, and you can give uh, online there. You can just follow the instructions there uh, to give. And, and all that's given tonight and uh, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night uh, will be given to the team uh, for, their, for the conference for this weekend. So uh, get the guys to come on forward to take up the offering. Is there doing that yeah go ahead guys uh as they are doing that uh tomorrow we'll meet at 10 o'clock uh and then tomorrow night will be six o'clock rather than seven so six o'clock tomorrow night and then sunday will be uh, 10 in the morning and so anyway it's a great great night it was really really good the worship i, I really enjoyed the worship thank you worship team and terry's message was really really powerful as well so wait I don't have a joke to tell while they're taking up the offering but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. I 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want to tell some of those jokes you were telling us on the way up here? That, that, would, be, that would go over good. All right. All right. God bless you. Thank you for coming. We'll see you in the morning at 10. God bless.